Hey there, welcome to Latina to Latina. I'm Alicia Menendez, your host and contributing editor at Basel. Each episode, I'll be talking to Latinas on the rise. We're going to talk about how they got to where they are, how the way they grew up made them who they are, and, you know, get inspired to be our best selves. I'm Latina, but I'm also all different types of things. Hollywood is so specific when it comes to Latino, and that needs to change. This episode, I'll be talking to Jackie Cruz, one of the breakout stars of Netflix's Orange is the New Black. For six seasons, she's brought Flaca Gonzalez to life, but she's also been fighting for causes like DACA and recording her first album. Somehow, in the midst of all of that, Jackie made time to talk with me about her music, her sexuality, and those fiercely Latina gatherings you've seen on Instagram. Let's talk a little bit about Orange is New Black. Yeah. Can you believe it's the sixth season? Mm -mm. No, man. I get tingles. I remember the moment I got the role. I was in a bad relationship at the time really bad and he was like you were never happy like that with me I was like what this is my dream you know this so starting orange was hard for me because of my bad relationship but I had to cut that out and you know the moment I cut that person out of my life everything started to fall in place it is so crazy and that was the hardest thing for me the hardest thing I ever had to do. But, like, it made me strong. In my music, you'll, you'll hear it. There's a song about it. <laughs> How much did getting the show play into being ready to break up? I was hoping that there was just going to, our relationship was going to grow, you know what I mean, from that. I was finally happy. I was working, uh, you know, in a club, season one and two, as a bottle service waitress. People would recognize me, right? Let's say at One Oak, right? I worked at One Oak. I worked at Lavo, right? I'm still very good friends with Noah Tevenberg. And I was so freaking happy because people were recognizing me for my work. And I was in a place where I didn't really want to be. And it was so funny because I asked for season two premiere, like, day off, which before I got hired, I asked for that. And then I got an email from the, the manager I need to know what's more important to you, your Broadway show or your job. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to go with the Broadway show, but it's on Netflix. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I still go into One Oak. They treat me incredible. You know, I get my own table. So, so was it at that point to you then like, is it that you make enough money or that you just feel confident enough in the show that you say I no longer need them. All of them. So <laughs> this is the thing. I didn't I got fired. I got fired. It wasn't enough money yet. First season, second season, third season. No, no, no. Not the money. Trust me, I needed the money. After season three, I felt like they started realizing that, you know, I was a, a part of the actual crew and they started to pay us. But at the beginning it was very one line, two line, you know. It's funky because that's not your experience as the viewer. Like it, it, I mean that in a few ways. I mean, like, I felt your presence. Yeah. And it felt like you were a big part of that cast in those first few seasons. And also, it seemed like you were a celebrity and you were <laughs> living large. It's blowing my mind to mm -hmm. think of you doing waitressing while oh, you yeah. were Oh, yeah. I that. would actually go to work with my waitressing outfit after because it was 6 a.m., and then Kate Mulgrew was like, where did you come from? Because I'm wearing fishnet stockings, holes in them. My eyes are like, you know, bleeding like black. <laughs> and then I'm like, I came from the club. <laughs> like, and it's like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I waitress. She's like, oh, mm -hmm, OK. <laughs> and so at what point does that stop? They made me series regular season four, and then I could support myself. And it's not like we're living large, you know? Like, people need to know that some of us are like Cinderella, you know? We return the dress at midnight, and uh, we borrow these diamonds, and I'm freaking scared to lose them. Like, I try not to drink in case, like, one of these diamonds fall off, because or else you have to pay for it, you know what I mean? You know, the last time I saw you is almost exactly two years ago. We had a dynamic conversation because you are a dynamic person. But I feel like something has shifted for you in the last two years where you were involved in activism and causes before. But that is like to the 10th degree right now. Yeah. And more comfortable talking about it and putting it out there. What has changed? Yeah. I mean, I've been... <sighs> 
I think when you first share your opinion to the public, you knowing because you're a journalist, it's scary because people don't agree with you. And I was scary to talk about what I believed in and people like, you know, not agreeing with me and being you know the trolls online and I'm like oh my god they think I'm terrible because of my opinion the president was a reality star why is his opinion more important than mine so I started to share it and not care what people thought and Carmen Perez is my mentor and as you can see she's a very powerful woman and she's From the women's march yeah is how I feel most like people she's trained me to yeah. be like not care anymore and just fight for what you believe in and she's such a powerful person like she'll walk into a room and everybody will notice her just her energy is so incredible and I just feel like she's just helped me become myself when it comes to activism and and understanding that I want to change a lot what's happening in the world and you can't do it alone and since I have a platform I put my messages out there bring awareness to the things that I believe are true and need to be changed and what if you like it you could unfollow me you know, but um, I don't care anymore. Tell me about the process of that change. Like, does it start with just putting stuff out there and like running away? Does it start with putting stuff out there and and bracing yourself for the feedback? Like, how do you get to a place where it is okay that people are going to disagree with you? I just started not to really try. I try not to read the comments too much. And um, but I do I do read the comments because people do support me and I want them to know I saw you. You know, and I also want people to understand that I'm just a person like you and my voice is as strong as yours. Just maybe I have a little more people following me. I mean, we're getting like all that right now with the children, you know, in in that high school. Emma Gonzalez, she stood up for what she believed in because she felt that pain and you felt it when you heard her words and her tears come out and look how powerful her voice was and it's giving a voice to the kids in high school right now they know that they're not alone so some of the things i've seen you posting about let's start with daca Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why why is that important to you well i'm a dreamer i think we are all dreamers and i moved here well my mother had me in queens right but then i moved to the dominican republic and i was raised in a third world country So I was raised in America and in Dominican Republic, so I've seen it all. I've seen very poor, poor, and I've seen very rich, rich. So I've, I started very poor, poor. So I understand, I understand. I'm just like you. You know what what I mean? What's very poor, poor? What does that mean to you? Like to me, it's like not having opportunity, not having the better education. Like when I moved from the Dominican Republic to the United States, my grades were down because my education wasn't up to par for the states because the Dominican Republic, I went to a private school, thank God, because my mother, you know, she had the uh, resources to help me go to an American school in the DR, which that doesn't happen very often. But regardless, the education was not very high. And I had to work really hard because I moved here during high school. So what I mean is like, I was surrounded by El Campo, like the village. And I saw, you know, you know, I was I didn't live in El Campo, but, you know, I lived in a little apartment with my mom. But I got, you know, across the street, there was a tin house. You know what I mean? So I grew up seeing this. I grew up walking down the street and seeing little girls like my age ask for money. And maybe that's what made me who I am today and why I want to fight so hard for for DACA, because I feel like not everybody gets that opportunity. And maybe the parents brought the children here to get that opportunity that we don't have in our countries. So and then when I posted something about the DREAM Act, I was getting really mean comments about it. Like that, what? Like what do people say, say? The fears that they have that the dreamers are taking benefits and then immigrants are criminals. Right. Uh, let me just give you a fact. DACA recipients are not eligible for federal benefits. Even with the billions they pay Social Security and payroll taxes will not even allow them to get anything. And second, undocumented immigrants are less likely to commit a crime than native-born. It's a proven fact. And it's crazy. It's crazy to me. It's just, I mean, I just feel so connected because I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I was lucky enough to be born here, but what does that, what is that? Like, I was just born here. How is how am I different than than them? I still had a dream. It was still hard for me too. I feel like they deserve it as much as any of us. They're actually helping our country. I don't understand. As you become more of a public person and as your star continues to rise, do you find that you get more or less of those opportunities to really, really connect with someone? 
maybe more, because I'm more comfortable in the room now. Last year, I went to the Vanity Fair Oscar party, and I didn't have a drink. I didn't do anything. I was just happy to be there, you know, surrounded by these stars that you grew up, I don't know, like Salma Hayek, that I was just like, oh my God, Salma, I'm breathing her air. <laughs> and um, I looked at Salma, and I was like, can I say that for it? Fuck it, I'm going in. And I went in, and um, it was the best three minutes of my life. And I said, Salma, I don't think anybody gives you enough credit. You've opened so many doors for us Latinas. I just want to tell you that I'm up and coming, and I play this small role in this big show. And thanks to you, I feel like I can do it. And she's like, fuck them. <laughs> That's what she said. Don't listen to them. She's like, you can do anything you want. What show are you on? I said, this show. And I said, I play Flaca. She's like, you know, I don't watch your show, but I'm going to watch it now. <laughs> right? And I said, oh my God, that means everything. She's like, because of you. Right? And I was like, okay, oh my God. So guess what I did? The next day, I sent her flowers and I sent her a note saying, I know that we didn't spend much time together, but it was amazing. Thank you so much for being so nice to me because not everybody is and she talked to me and it was just beautiful and guess what she did she posted it on her Instagram with a picture of me and said I'm really happy for the future of like Latinas or something she said something beautiful and I was just like dying that Salma Hayek acknowledged me and knows who I am and will maybe watch the show because I'm in it <laughs> fame is so strange because in our office, people are running around being like, Jackie Cruz is coming. Jackie Cruz. Like, Man, the doors. Jackie Cruz is coming. Oh, and so please. it's like weird to imagine a scenario where you are not the most famous person in oh, the room. Oh, every room I'm in. But it's great because you know what? I say I like to be the weakest link in my crew because that's how you learn. You learn from people around you. I mean... I was literally, um, Sebastian Sadigi is a director that directs music videos for Def Jam. And he directed my first video for Selena that I did like, I don't know, three or four years ago. And he's been killing it in Def Jam. And he's like, Jackie, because he's been, you know, listening to me and I, that I want to direct. And he's like, do you want to come be my apprentice <laughs> at um, this video shoot I'm doing? And uh, it's for an artist for Def Jam. I said, hell Yeah. So I canceled everything. I was going to LA. I canceled everything. And I went in and um, I was the second AD. I was the casting director. I was the babysitter of the actress. I was everything. I was like, is that, what, is that who we are? It's terrible. No, but it's, you know, I'm like, it's okay. But he saw that I went in there as a student and he respected that. And um, not knowing that, you know, I was going to get this, but he lent me those cameras that are incredible cameras with Star Wars lenses to, to shoot my music video last Sunday because I was, I mean, he, I guess, doesn't really know me that well because I'm, that's just who I am. You know, I want to learn. And he just saw a different side of me. And he was like, I'm really proud that, like, I don't know, that you really want to do this. And I am so looking forward to your growth because I think you can do it. And when I was shadowing him, I was like, I think I could do this. Yep. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I have I have visions now, and I write them down, and uh, I just, I, I want to, like, help direct most of my music videos for my music, because my music and film are very much intertwined, because it's what's happening in the world for me. And I've been waiting my whole life to create an album. So it's, like, my first album. And I was I was going to do an EP, and then someone was like, why don't you just do an album? And I was like, okay. Can you explain the difference for someone who doesn't know? Um, an EP is just something small, like three or four songs of like a nine-song album. So it's like a, just a small part so of you an said, album. So you basically said, like, I want to do a 5K, and someone's like, just run a marathon. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. why go small? Yeah, exactly. And I was like, you know what? You're right. And I've been so lucky. Like, I went to the Latin Grammys with Billboard. I got to go behind the scenes and interview all these dope, like, Diplo, like, producers, Bad Bunny, all these dope producers. And I'm like, I'm going to work with you one day. And they're looking at me like, uh-huh. But they will. Trust me. I'm putting it out there. And, you know, they don't know I sing. So if I have to put the music out there myself, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, Hollywood or whatever. They're not really visual 
they don't really have imagination, believe it or not. So you have to put it in front of their face so they can see it. 100%. Same with me being like, I'm Latina, but I'm also all different types of things. So instead of me just being in a box, like, oh, she's Latina, that's all she is. No, no, no. I'm creating film. I'm writing my own film because you know what? I've been auditioning. I've been this close to getting it and I don't get it because of the way I look. Because I don't look Mexican, I don't, know. I don't look Dominican, I don't look Puerto Rican, I don't look this. Because they don't know what I look like. Because Hollywood is so specific when it comes to Latino. And that needs to change. And that's why I started Unspoken Productions. It's not for me anymore. I'm opening doors for people like me, so for the underrepresented person. When you talk about Latinas and and being a part of Hollywood and sort of the the challenges of diversifying... I have spied you in almost all of those fiercely Latina, hashtag fiercely Latina oh, gatherings, yeah, yeah. which is, my understanding is put together by Gina Rodriguez, Eva right, uh, right. Longoria. Mm-hmm. What's it like when you are in a room with literally everyone who the industry would look at and say, that's our competition? I mean, listen, when I walked into that room, because I went to one of them, I walked into one of the gatherings and again, we're surrounded by people who want to help you and people who are working in the industry and it's cool. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I walked in the room, I was sticking out like a sore thumb, me and this other girl with an afro, <laughs> you know, and I got her number because I was in a room where almost everyone looked the same. So let's just break that down. I mean, I, this is the first time I talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no, 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 but let's talk about it. There's been critique online about the fact that when, even when we talk about Latinas in Hollywood, it's, it's largely, and I'll, let me be real also, it's also Latinas who look like me. It's yeah. white Latinas. And so there's a question of, are you actually putting full diversity out there? Or are you only putting one representation of what a Latina can look like? So tell me, what, what well, was that experience? Well, this is the thing. It's just LA. It's a certain type. It's different. That's why, look, I quit acting for six years and I moved to New York. I moved to California when I was 15 and I got into my bad car accident when I was 17. I quit acting. I focused on music. Music brought me to New York. I didn't want to act because what was I? I was a gangster's girlfriend. I was a victim who was raped. And these were the the characters that I was going out for. And yeah, maybe I did two roles, but everything else, you don't look the role. You don't look the type. That's the problem, I think, with Hollywood. I think that it doesn't really matter. It shouldn't really matter what you look like, in a way. Even if you're playing a Spanish person, okay, and if you are Spanish, that's great. But I really think that the talent should be the number one key, right? If you're going in for Latino, you say you're Latina, you go in for the role, we all look different. You go to my country, there is a blonde and blue-eyed baby, and there's also a dark, dark skin, dark hair baby. There's all kinds. My mother is dark. So what then is the experience like in that room with all those other women? I'm going to be honest with you. Everybody's angry. Everybody's angry at something. Some people were thankful to be in the room, thanking our host. It was just a really contradicting room. Everybody in the community, I feel, has an issue. And, you know, Gloria um, Collette, um, Calderon Calderon. Mm Collette, she's incredible. She's my friend. And she just did History of Them, another show. And, yeah, it it is with a Cuban. And, yeah, I Which is her experience. Yeah, which is her experience. And I'm telling you. When I'm doing my own thing, I'm going to put my people up because that's my experience. So if you have a problem, I think that instead of talking about it and complaining, do something about it. Because that's what I'm doing. Regardless, I'm always working. Like on my show, I'm not just an actress there. I'm, I'm watching what people do. I'm asking questions. And that's what you have to do. I'm trying to learn every little thing about the industry. I just feel like... We, we should have a gathering in New York so we, sh- so we see the difference in um, the communities in L.A. and in New York and, and the diversity in New York that, it, that is not in L.A. I also would love to see you do it across industries because I think part of it is like it's helpful for Latinas in, in media and entertainment to know one another. But like what's actually most powerful is for Latinas across industries yep. to have those relationships and yep. to get better about like, you know, that, that thing where it's like you have someone's cell number, not so that you can text them with annoying stuff, but so that when it really comes down to it and you need someone, you need to be able to get in front of them, that you have that relationship. Yeah. And I think cross pollinating is the way to yeah, do that. I agree. Like if I just hang out with other lady journalists, that actually only takes me so far. It's so true. 
It's so true. You have to cross. This like is how me. I invited myself to Jackie Cruz's apartment for a social <laughs> event. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I think it's really interesting to get even business women who are in there, like all types of women, all types of even men. I agree. I think that men need to to help us, too. I feel like it's just the Latino community that they're not supporting each other because there's only one seat at the table and some people are a little selfish to share or open up another chair because they think it was so hard to get here. Maybe it's my only chance. You want to talk about Me Too? Yeah. I feel like the Me Too movement was incredible because it, it brought awareness to what's happening in the, you know, in, the, in the world, really. It's not just in Hollywood, obviously. It happens in every... And any workplace, really, and um, any kind of workplace. You know, I used to be a bottle service waitress. I mean, it happens everywhere. I just feel, we feel like we should layer into the Me Too movement because of, you know, maybe women who were incarcerated felt excluded, women out of prison felt excluded. So, you know, maybe we want to add a layer to the Me Too movement to include every single person who's this happened to, and it's okay to talk about it, and you're not alone. So what is your access point for this conversation? Like, what is your experience of it? I feel like women who are incarcerated don't really have a voice. And since I'm working in a show about prison, I've become involved with the Women's Prison Association and meeting the women after, you know, they're in prison and even within prison. And they, prison is, is, it's like slavery and... I'm going to be honest with you. It's terrible what's going on in there. And they don't really feel like they have a voice. So if I have to, like, scream it, I will for them. I think for a lot of women, in light of this conversation, we're now looking back on things that we dismissed or decided to bury or decided not to tell anyone because we didn't feel we could, that now we're revisiting and we're saying... That, that really was inappropriate or that, that really did make me so deeply uncomfortable or that did change the trajectory of my career. I mean, do you have moments like oh, that Oh, yeah, now? I have a few moments like that. I mean, when I first moved to Miami, it was because a man told me he worked with Selena. Not Gomez. I love you, Selena Gomez, but I'm talking about Quintanilla. <laughs> so he worked with Selena Quintanilla, and he liked the tone of my voice, and he said, I would like to work with you, but, you know, I work in Miami, and um, he won all these Grammys, and he said that um, he needed $10,000 and that he would help me make my music and videos and all this stuff. And I I moved, you know, and it was not what he said. And he stole my money, and he made me feel uncomfortable a lot of times. I was in a car alone with him. You know, we would listen to music, and it was just uncomfortable situations. And then he stole my money, and he said, no one's going to listen to you. You're nobody. You're nothing. You're this, you're that. He made me feel very, it was fucked up. And, like, never in my life has a man made me feel so small. I don't even want to mention his name because I feel like the universe, you know, will take care of that for me or God, whatever you believe in. So, yeah, there's a lot to talk about because I feel like the Me Too movement um it, it it it's just not just a gender you know it's not just all women what about the women of color i don't know it, i just feel like it it's harder for us to speak up because uh, people don't take us that serious maybe it's it's harder to speak up because maybe we haven't made it that big yet and people think that we're just talking and I think there's also a fear of becoming a problem woman. Oh, she's so difficult. She's always complaining. Yeah. She's always got a problem. And blah, before blah, blah. I'm like there, I can't be complaining about what's happening when I'm not even there yet. You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain I, that. I know exactly what you mean. To come and speak out about your truth is scary, period. Just Just to put yourself out there. I think to talk about times where you have been taken advantage of women are trying to reclaim that as a way of 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 reclaiming power but it can make you feel really vulnerable in the short term and I think there's also a concern among people who don't feel like they've like you're saying have like reached their destination that it can be a detour that it can become the thing you're known for do you learn to trust people again 
Um, it was hard because I'm I've been in a relationship now for three years, and um, he had to work really hard to get my trust. Still, still has to work hard. I learned um, a person who doesn't let you be be yourself. That's the person that you don't want to be with at all. If you have to walk on eggshells, if you have to like watch what you say, if you have to be careful of what you dream, definitely walk away right away, ASAP, because. Honestly, like the person I'm with now, I could f- I have wings. Like I can go anywhere I want, not worry about a darn thing. Trust is the number one key and um and he's I'm also bisexual and he's okay if I like girls. <laughs> so <laughs> So I play I you know, play around. <laughs> was that a part of your agreement up front that you could play around? Or was that a midway through conversation? It was like recent conversation because I have a girl crush. But he always knew. I never really talked about it with any of my boyfriends. This is the first time like that I felt comfortable in my own skin to tell him you know, I'm attracted to women. I love you, but I am also attracted to women. And he's OK with that. And he's OK with if something happens or something like I don't I'm not trying to have threesomes or anything. I told him that very clear. If it's anything, it's just me and her. You bye. <laughs> and he's like, OK, can I draw you at least? <laughs> he's an artist. I don't know. We'll see the future. We'll see. But just the fact that he felt comfortable having that conversation. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's the first time I, I can be myself. <sighs> and it feels so good. You know, and my family is probably not going to be very happy with me again because the Latino family, like, they put you in a box, too. I really cut everyone almost out of my life. Like, my dad recently, we had a huge fight because my legal name is Jacqueline Chavez. And I go by Jackie Cruz. And um, I've changed my name 10 times throughout my career to fit in. And, you know, Cruz stuck. It's a part of, like, deep in the family. But... Chavez I never really liked and so I have a song which is my single and it's called Hija de Chavez and I let him hear it and it's kind of like not really that nice about him and he was like oh a really nice song I'm like then you're not really listening you're not listening so then we got into a fight recently and he's like once you change your name I realized that I'm not important to you and he's not understanding he's not understanding me he thinks that I'm not making time for him because I don't want to and I and it's not that it's because I'm busy like this is my moment and I, I'm just working so hard and some of my family they don't get that and especially my dad who was never in my life is tr- is giving me a hard time I'm like no I didn't give you a hard time I gave you so many chances why aren't you giving me a chance so I'm opening up with my album I'm talking about my dad I'm talking about when a guy grabbed my ass at the Grammys, went underneath my dress and cupped my ass and no one did anything and I screamed at him and I was surrounded by people in Vegas. No one did anything. They said, he's not worth it. And he walked away. He was a drunk, white, male businessman. And it was the Grammys and I was looking like an artist. Like, you have no right to touch me. So I wrote a song called Make Me Change, which is You Can't Make Me Change. And I just did the music video. It's kind of like... I had a day like where I'm going to the studio and, you know, the photographer is making me take off things and I'm like annoyed, you know, and it's just kind of like I I break down and then I have someone in the end calm me down and it's Maddie Brewer. She's in, I don't know if you know who she is, she's in Handmaid's Tale and she played Trisha and um, she's featured in my video and it's the most beautiful thing you'll ever see. She's in Handmaid's Tale. She's the one that With has the eye. eye. Yeah. She gets me. Mm-hmm. And we're working not only, she's also a singer. So whenever I have concerts or whatever, I always ask her to come in and sing with us because she has a beautiful voice. And then um, I have a band called The Family Portrait. And that's just something I do for fun. In what time? I know. But yeah, I have a lot of music coming in and it's fun because I get to produce. I've been slowly but surely almost getting like big roles. This is the first time I could say I'm proud of who I am and who I've become and like what I want to do in the future. Thank you so much for having me because we could talk all day. (laughs) 
That's it for now, but we want to hear from you. Email us at Latina to Latina at Bustle.com. Send us ideas for awesome guests or whatever it is you're thinking about right now. Remember to subscribe to Latina to Latina on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening. And please leave a review. We love hearing from you. Latina to Latina is produced by Lentigua Williams & Co., mixed by Oluwakemi Aladesui, with assistance from Anna Parsons. Our executive editor is Emily Ann Epstein. Our editorial supervisor is Roseanne Salvatore. And we got to give a special thank you to Jenny Hollander. <laughs>